What if I have it over E? Right now I've got like, it's a different energy entirely. It's so cool, what about over yeah. C? It's also the job of a composer to create a world for someone to live in. It's like a mindset switch. Um, and it's one of the first things that I teach people how to do. Welcome everybody to the Jazz Lab podcast. Today I am here with the great Stephen Feifke, who is a Grammy award-winning pianist and composer. Really excited to have you here, whether you are listening on a streaming platform or watching this on YouTube. This is gonna be an incredible episode. I've known Stephen for many, many years. It is an honor to have you here, Stephen. Thanks so much for being here. Dude, thank you for having me. Yeah, Skidmore, 2008. <laughs> yeah, that's when we met, yeah. isn't it? Yep, summer so, jazz camp. Skidmore Jazz Institute. Yeah, we met at jazz camp. You know, it's a, <laughs> it's a beautiful thing. It sure is, Noah. Back to you. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you very much. I, I get the feeling already that this is going to be a humorous episode, which makes me very happy. Awesome. I also want to say a huge thanks to Casio for sponsoring today's episode. More on that later. So, yeah, you know, it's been really incredible because you're someone who obviously I've known for so many years. So I still remember us walking around at Skidmore and nerding out about jazz and different pianists. And now you're here on the podcast <clears throat> having just come off a Grammy win. So that's absolutely incredible. And I also, so I was just at your show, as you well know, at <laughs> Dizzy's Jazz Club Coca-Cola in New York. It's true. He was. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed, I was. He can, you're, you're my I can, witness. I can vouch. <laughs> <laughs> so really cool thing was that you announced that you had actually written and recorded six albums in a single year, which I think regardless is just an absolutely incredible achievement for any artist. So start with an easy question. What was that like? What made you feel like you actually wanted to do that? And what are the albums? Tell us about it. Yeah, sure. So it's over the course of two years, just over two years, in fact. And it started with a big band album called Kinetic, which was released in April of last year and or two years ago, I, I, you know, time. But yeah, and I had recorded that just before, uh, I guess, a year before the quarantine slash lockdown part of the pandemic began. And I had some release plans. We were going to be playing at the Blue Note. We had some summer jazz festivals lined up and I was super excited to get the music out there. And of course, like when the pandemic hit properly um, and everything sort of paused, I, like many other people said, you know, let's wait. Let's just, I, I, I just wanted to wait to release the music because the, that live aspect of it is so much a part of the music itself. And I waited and I waited and I waited and I waited. And then I was like, okay, enough waiting. Like, let's, let's put it out. And so I, I did, and um, I'd also had some other music recorded. And so released Kinetic, uh, and then followed it up with a record called Prologue, which was sort of the beginnings of my big band. You know, when I started recording and releasing big band music, I was doing so as like YouTube singles, and uh, I had this music, and I felt that it was a part of my musical story. and. So I decided to share that as well. And, you know, in terms of where we're at right now with Catalyst, which is the record that I just released, Catalyst is the first music that we recorded live in the studio. We recorded it in New York City at Power Station, which is formerly known as Avatar, which was formerly known as Power Station. <laughs> and <laughs> so it's, it's, it's achieved the trifecta cycle. And, uh, yeah, we recorded it live and it features some awesome friends, uh, some awesome musicians, you know, Chad Lepkowitz Brown, Danny Vanak, Martina Da Silva, Brian Carter. And the cool thing is that a lot of the, the musicians in my band are the same musicians that I've had since I started the thing uh, about 10 years ago. Yeah, I guess the, the question of why that you asked, for me, it's just, uh, I, 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 love, I love music to my core. Um, it is a huge part of my soul. It is a huge part of my expression as a human being. And as artists, you know, we have the unique capability of connecting with that inner musical voice that we all have as artists. Uh, that is a gift that we worked on, work on over the course of our entire lives to connect that artistic, uh, Part of ourselves in the craft you know that is the method of like how do we actually communicate 
this information, like what notes do I need to play to tell this emotion? What notes do I need to, to play to tell that emotion? And, you know, a collection of emotions, a collection of facts, you know, story. And so there's a platform now in the modern world to put out music that is just uh, way faster than it has ever been before. And I feel really lucky to have an incredible team, not just of musicians, but also of label partnerships that helped me to <clears throat> put out my music in the most conducive way possible. And so I definitely would not be able to do any of that without uh, an incredible team. Um, so it's a, you know, it's a longer conversation that, you know, we can have, um, but I, I, I think that that's probably a good place to sort of uh, leave it for now. Cool. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah, well, I think it's, you know, as a composer, I would imagine it can be a challenge to write that much music, but then at the same time, you know, maybe for someone like you, it's not, right? Maybe the music just comes out. So, you know, from the, I, have, I have a couple of questions about the, the business perspective as well, but from the compositional perspective, I think one thing that I myself and probably a lot of people listening right now might struggle with is actually the process of just being inspired, right? Writer's block. So totally. Yeah. What's your, do you have any things that you do to help stay motivated and actually help you have such a large output of music? Wow. Well, writer's block and, you know, thanks for the tacit compliment as well. I appreciate it very much. Um, and the, the writer's block thing is a question that I get asked a lot. And <clears throat> I think, you know, you, it's also something that I experience a lot. I think that anybody who tells you that they don't experience writer's block maybe got so good at navigating how to interact with that natural part of the process that is there for everybody that they just don't notice it anymore. But it's absolutely a part of the process and it's actually, in my opinion, something that can be embraced um, rather than avoided. Because if you think about it, if you avoid a natural part of the writing process, just like I'm pausing right now to find the right words to express my, my story, when we pause in the musical creation process, we can sometimes blame it on writer's block. Instead of saying, okay, no, my mind just needs to kind of catch up to where my heart is or wherever the inspiration for the song is coming from. You know, sometimes music can inspire music and we can use, you know, I just was talking with a great composer, Darcy James Argue, about the Fibonacci sequence and how he uses the, that in his compositional process, which is so cool and I was nerding out. But then there's also another part of us that is just kind of like heart first and you know in that way the intangible is what inspires music and so um that sort of brings us to to the actual part of writing down what we hear because that's usually the part that we really truly notice writer's block is when we go to write it down when we go to make something that is impermanent that is improvisational when we go to make that thing permanent when we go and write that down somehow there's a shift, like a, a, a switch that gets flipped on and off in our brains um, that says, okay, this is different. Now, now the way that I'm writing is different. It's more permanent, it's more serious. Do I really mean this that I just said? Did I mean something else? We start asking so many, so many questions and some of those questions are really positive. Those are necessary questions to ask. And then some of those questions are actually, in my personal opinion, less positive than others. And so one of my, my good friends, a contemporary of ours, Brian Kroc, another great composer, uh, has this quote, he says, don't analyze. And it's actually a song that he included on his first record, his first big man record, Big Heart Machine. And we were talking and he, and he said, this is a mantra that he, that he says, don't analyze. And, and I love that. And it's something that I've adopted and uh, something that I share all the time with my students, don't analyze, don't analyze. What does that mean? It means that when we judge ourselves in the musical creation process, that we are actually unable to interact with the parts of the process, whether it's up here in like our inspiration land, whatever, like the intangible things that get inputted to our brains and hearts and even our bodies, you know, like there's a physical thing of making music, right? <laughs> like that's physical, like I'm using my body. So all of these different elements of what makes us human come together in a moment. And writer's block happens when we start to push one thing away instead of embracing whatever comes in. 
And so having some sort of a process to write all that stuff down, to get it out of your head and then organize it later. You know, once you have it written down, you have all of the elements of the musical DNA of a song, you know, which is rhythm, melody, and harmony. That's the, in my opinion, musical DNA of everything. We reorganize those things in terms of an arrangement and we present them to an ensemble in terms of orchestration. And orchestration can also exist at the piano. This thing just lit up. It must have sensed my, no, it's on a loop. It knows, it knows. It knows. <laughs> so anyway, I, you know, I can keep talking and talking and talking and, and ultimately, you know, writer's block, in my opinion, should be embraced as a natural part of the writing, the writing process. And um, the more comfortable you get with experiencing it, the less afraid of it you become, which means that your writing process becomes more improvisational than uh, analytical, which is funny because you're writing something down. It's like a mindset switch. Um, and it's one of the first things that I teach people how to do is to embrace that writing process as an improvisational tool, kind of like we're talking right now. Amazing, that's beautiful. And I think you know, it reminds me a bit of some of Kenny Werner's teachings a little bit. It reminds me of one thing he said, which was, I asked him, and, and it, this is a very common thing he talks about, what about, how does effortless mastery, you know, his whole concept of effortless mastery, how does that apply to composition? And he kind of asked me, well, if you're trying to write something good, you know, and you're struggling, what do you do? And, and I was like, I don't know, what do you do? And he was like, just write something bad. <laughs> you know, just stop trying to write something good. <laughs> yeah, wow. You know, and it, it allows suddenly, as soon as you let go of that over analysis, that analysis of is what I'm doing right now good, or is this what I want to say, et cetera, et cetera, and just try to do something bad. Suddenly all the pressure mm. that you put on yourself flies out the window. But that's a, that's a great segue into composition itself. So first question, is there a specific way that you like to get started with a composition? And when does inspiration strike? So do you have a compositional method that you always follow or is it different every time? It's a really good question. I've noticed that there is some sort of a system that exists, but that system does not exist in a vacuum, which what I mean to say is that while there are certain steps of the process that are similar every time, you don't need to start at step one every time. You know, you don't need to start the piano every time. Sometimes you might have an idea that you just end up singing, right? So that's two different methods of approaching. So yes and no is the, is the answer to that question. Um, I think it's about <clears throat> being able to receive different parts of the music that comes to us naturally. You know, the, even the question of does like where when does inspiration strike? How does inspiration like what like what well, what is inspiration? I don't I don't know. You know, this is something that as a as a composer, you know, you hope to be inspired, but sometimes you're just not. And that's okay. And that's cool. And so I think that having some sort of a system in place that is just there helps to recognize like different parts of a natural process. You can embrace different steps along the way. I oftentimes say that like, in terms of writing a big band chart, because that's a lot of what I do as a composer, writing for larger ensembles, whether I'm arranging and orchestrating something that already is an existing composition or whether I'm starting from scratch with my own work, you know, I find that you know, organizing the ideas and having a system that allows me to organize the ideas is super important. That does allow me to embrace the various locations that I might receive inspiration from, whether it's external or whether it's internal. Love it. So let's say that tomorrow you had a show coming up and you promised the audience there would be a new composition, but you didn't write it yet. And you were feeling writer's block. What would be your method of making it happen? What, what might you do? That's a great question. Um, I think probably what I would do in a case like that is that I would, I would probably go on a walk, probably drink some coffee. I would probably not take any technology with me. And I would just try and notice things around me. 
and take it all in. I had a, a gig come up one time that was the first time that I was like properly commissioned to write something for TV. And I got a call like super late at night. It was very late. I almost didn't pick up the phone. I was watching Ted Lasso <laughs> and, um, and, uh, but there was like an LA area code. And so I picked up the phone. I was like, hello. It was like, yeah, we got your name and number from so-and-so we have a chart that we need done by tomorrow morning. I was like, oh, great. Um, great. And, um, and so I was super nervous about that, that gig when it came up because, you know, of course I trusted myself to be able to do it. And as a working arranger, um, as a working composer, these are things that do happen. You know, these, these are things that do happen in your career. And basically what I did is that I, I created a lead sheet of the arrangement of the, of the song, my own lead sheet, not like a real book version. I created a lead sheet of it. And then I sat down with that lead sheet and with my keyboard, you know, cause it was late. I, I played it out and I played around with it. And over the next hour or so, like I got some, some ideas. And so I started to jot down like an order of the arrangement. I call that a word sketch for a chart. And so I wrote down that word sketch. And the good thing about a word sketch is that you can actually kind of write a chart before you even write the whole thing. And then I started to think, okay, well, I've got this orchestra that I've got to write for is for studio orchestra. So it, which means big band plus string section. And I knew that I ultimately had to get there, but in order to explode like a lead sheet for a full orchestra, like how do you get there? Okay, obviously you can't just write the same line for every person in the ensemble. So you need to have some sort of harmony taking place. And so I started to jot down some of the certain notes that, that, I, that I knew were gonna work in terms of like presentations of the harmony, whether it was like a, uh, a certain kind of voicing or whether it was a certain kind of counter melody. And then after I had all that information written down in like a really neat and easy way where I could still see like the musical DNA of the song, I said, okay, let me orchestrate this. Let me, let me go and assign these different notes to each of the members of the ensemble. Like who am I hearing play this? Because the thing is, is that the musical DNA is there no matter what, right? No matter what instrument is playing a certain melody, a certain harmony, right? That note is there. It exists as a note. And so then I go and I decide slash I let the music tell me like what notes go where for which instrument. And then I make the chart look nice and pretty, which is called engraving. And that's more or less, you know, the, the, the five step process that I noticed exists in terms of how I approach writing music. Now, in terms of what I said before about the process not existing in a vacuum, you know, you can have the ability to say, okay, you know what, I'm writing for an orchestra. Maybe I want to start with like the high strings, you know, doing something and then maybe a low melody. I don't know exactly what this song is. Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so as soon as I start to enter the space, which is another Kenny Warner-ism, the space, um, I'm a huge fan of the effortless mastery thing as well and all props to Kenny, like what, a, what an amazing teacher that guy is and musician, of course. As soon as I start to enter that space, the thing that I have to remind myself of is that, no, you know what, I'm not just entering an improvisational space, I am also writing something. And so the process that I just described works really, really well for writing an arrangement. But if I promise the audience a completely new original composition, there has to be some step that takes place first before any of that organizational thing happens. And so there's something that I call the musical creation process, which happens in three steps. It's basically like you have an idea somewhere, inspiration land, you know, that's what I call it, the inspiration land. And I don't know where these ideas come from. I just kind of trust that they are there. And when they're not there, I don't get scared anymore. And this is something we just talked about in terms of writer's block. And then there's something that happens in the middle and I'll just leave that there for a quick second. And then we have what's called machinery, which is what we use to basically communicate the inspiration. In other words, we're getting from inspiration to communication as quickly as possible. And so that machinery, if I'm playing piano, is like my fingers and my arms that are working together. If I'm singing, it's my diaphragm, it's my lungs, it's my, you know, my vocal cords, it's my mouth, it's shaping the pitch, it's blah, 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 blah. Blah, 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 blah. See, <laughs> machinery in action. <laughs> and, and in the middle of all that stuff, we have a processing center, which is our brain. And that's where we say to ourselves, 
how do I communicate this? And okay, I'm feeling happy. Okay, major. I'm feeling sad. Okay, minor. Right. But in that space, you know, the ideal thing to happen, and like oftentimes what a computer does is that we just get the answer immediately, right? The processing is so fast, there's 16, 32 gigs of RAM, whatever, right, that make the machine answer those questions, like our inputs, right? So if we're a computer and our inputs are inspiration and our outputs are, are whatever we use to communicate our musical information, the processing center tells us what do we actually want to say? How do we actually want to say it? And so the musical creation process doesn't exist in a vacuum either. And so you should be able to connect with all three aspects of your musical creation process sometimes at once, sometimes in, in a box, right? So in terms of um, writing like this, this high strings thing that I have going on, like, you know, maybe, maybe now that I'm thinking about it, like, okay, is this, a, is this actually a good register for these instruments? I, I don't know. Like, okay, well, I do know, but just for, for example's sake, you know, okay, and what about this? Like what, like, what instruments am I hearing there? And, as, and I, as soon as I start to think about that, I start to hear the instruments. And then I, you know, I, I, I love music so much, I just get distracted by the musical DNA. So I have to say like, okay, that's not bad either. Let's go with this, let's see where this is going. And so there has to be a part of the process, as I'm saying, that is existing at the top of everything that says, okay, let's just like see what happens. So in terms of going for a walk, drinking a cup of coffee, that's going to get me in a, in a place of just experiencing the world as it exists instead of feeling the pressure of like, okay, tomorrow's the concert. I promised the audience this incredible composition. Maybe I didn't say incredible. I hope I didn't say incredible, <laughs> but I have promised a new composition. How do I, how do I do that? And there's the art, which is, you know, the music. And then there's the craft, which is the how, right? And so these are the things that sort of work together to, to help us communicate what we want to communicate. And a composition is like, to me, it's a, it's a story. It's, it's a reflection of, you know, of me. It's a reflection of a part of me that existed at a certain point in time. And I think that the role of a composer is to be authentic to that creation process to tell an authentic story, which I don't think is so different to our jobs as human beings. And then it's also the job of a composer to create some sort of a world for someone to live in for however long the composition is. So the someones who are living in that composition, it's not just the audience, it's also the musicians on stage. You want someone to feel like they can be themselves playing your music. And this is another part of the process. And, and there's, there's so many different things that we can talk about here. But ultimately, composition is uh, a really beautiful thing, misconceived oftentimes um, in terms of its difficulty. But I think it's because of its permanence that people shy away and experience things like writer's block that, you know, I, that I think are just a natural part of the process. Um, yeah. Yeah. A lot of beautiful stuff in there. So I'm going to put you on the spot for a second. I thought you were reaching for the iPad and I was going to say that is exactly what we're going to need right now. Um, so I wanted to ask you how you would feel about actually diving a little bit into the technicality of arranging an orchestration a little bit here. So, you know, one thing that I find fascinating is that expansion process, right? So I'm kind of curious, let's say we were just gonna take the two bars of a melody of a song, something like that, any, any song. Cool, you give me a song. Sure, how about um, There Is No Greater Love? Something nice and simple. This is a thick um, oh, You want me pen. to make it thinner? I think I got it. Okay, cool. So I've got it down. Now Beautiful. What? So we got this tuned down. So I'm kind of curious, could you just walk us through, if if you feel like it, walk us through the process of actually what you might do to do something cool with this first two bars. Obviously, you know, we have to ignore its place in a full arrangement because we're not going to do a full arrangement right now. But yeah. just kind of curious, like how you might approach basically saying, all right, this two bars is my little mini composition for this podcast. And I'm going to 
write out, you know, through my five step system, the piano part of it, right? What's it going to look like on the piano? How am I going to approach the harmony? How am I going to maybe conceptualize, um, you know, expanding this into a specific group of musicians? Why am I choosing this format versus another format? You know, I, I often find that on this podcast, the best thing we can do is just put someone in their element. It's such a great way of seeing how somebody actually works. So what do you think? Yeah, great. Um, well, I've already had a couple of ideas, which is I'm hearing like a, I'm hearing sort of like a kind of like a swing vibe with a big band. Um, and, you know, also I, you know, I, I do have a trio and I play, a, you know, arrangements of my compositions and standards. And I think that it's pretty similar, actually. You know, the, the musical DNA is, is so powerful and it's so strong that these bigger changes that we make, you know, one of the first things that I find people think about when they make an arrangement of something is like, how can I reharmonize this? Like, okay, yeah, but that's only one element of musical DNA. Like, what about the melody? How are you going to play it? Are you going to play it exactly how it exists in the real book? I hope not, <laughs> you know? Um, sincerely, you know, that's not how words work even. I don't know the lyrics to this song, but it can't sound good as like a perfect metronomic quarter note. Da 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 da. That can't sound good, right? Maybe it would be da da bi da bi di di do di da da do da wa. Right? Okay, so da wa. Maybe I'm hearing an instrument that can like bend. Or if I'm playing piano, I'm I'm singing. I'm not sure. I was not singing a pitch, but close enough. Regard, <laughs> regardless of that, so I'm, I'm starting to think to myself as like, how am I going to set this up? Am I going to really start playing right on the melody? Okay, maybe I am. But also, what if I just you know start with an F pedal or something? Okay, so maybe I'll write down just in, in words like start with F pedal. Should I should it be on two and four? What do you think? Don't boom, don't. Dun, 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 or maybe there's a rhythm involved there. Okay, so if I'm playing with a trio, I have to write down fewer things than if I'm writing with a big band, right? Because if I'm writing for a big band, I have to be really specific. There's 18 people involved. Like, not everybody can be improvising at the same time. Otherwise, there would be madness, mayhem, or not. But that would be a magic band, and please sign me up. But in terms of a trio, like, if I say to myself, okay, let's start with an F pedal. Okay, like, all right, one, two, one, two, three. Okay, like maybe the bass plays that. Maybe I join in for the first time or something, or maybe maybe the, the drums are, you know, now I'm starting to hear things on the piano. I'm starting to hear like some some sort of a descending thing. Okay, now I have an introduction. Now what was the part of that that was different from the F pedal? Well, putting me on the spot now. So I guess, were you essentially moving kind of the block chords around, creating a different sound of harmony over the F pedal, essentially? Sure, yeah, pianistically, like, absolutely. Like, you know, drop two voicings over some, but, but even that is like, that's improvisational, because I can go. And that accomplishes a similar effect, right? And that's where I start to think to myself, like, okay, if I'm writing this for a trio, maybe I want to keep it more improvisational because I might feel differently playing the song one day versus another day, right? So I, in giving less information to the page, I actually free myself up, right? Whereas when I write for a big band, I have to decide and it's very permanent and that's okay too. And I will feel, I could write this. This would go great for a saxophone, a berry down, or down here and, you know, Main brass, you know, with some sort of a fall. I don't know if I like that, but you know, it's an idea. Um, okay, so what I was really referring to, the thing that was different, is when I branched away from the F pedal and I had this three, six, two, five, right? And that was different. That clued us in that, some, that something's gonna happen. <laughs> No, it's not a fail at all. I, I think that it's kind of nice that it just felt natural. No, no, no. I meant uh, that I failed in. No, I know, but I don't think you did. <laughs> okay. I, I think that that's. I think that that's just. That's kind of the point. Um, 
of the thing is that there's these small little cues that you know we don't even think about as being a part of an arrangement but actually like if i just have the bass player if i just tell you know my trio like hey guys just vamp on an f and then i start playing like and i expect them to catch on they can't do that right so i have to have some something written down so if i say okay i'm going to start with an f pedal and then eventually like okay now i now i have like something in mind so if i just write like you know how many measures was that let's let's just call it eight measures so maybe now i have like d7 g7 c minor 7 f7 this is like ye old 3625 sus4 and, you know, ultimately, like, I would make this look a lot cleaner. Ta-da. But for a bassist and a drummer, like, this this says, like, okay, and I would not have the words actually start with an F pedal on there, um, on the on the chart, but just as an information for myself as a composer, this is a way of getting the thought out of my head. Okay, so now it's out of my head. Like, do I like it? Yes, no. Use it? Yes, no. How? Yes, no. Not exactly. Yes, no. In that how question, but yeah, whatever. And even the D7, G7, C minor 7, F7, like I can get more specific with that. I can say that it's a D7 sharp 9 chord. I can say it's a G7 uh, flat 13 chord. I can say it's a C minor 9 chord. I can say it's an F7. Uh, what did I play? I think I played actually B7, 13 at, at 9. That stuff is neither here nor there. Like I can get specific with it or I can leave it open-ended and have it be quote, like different every time um, in those subtle ways. But making this D7 chord sharp nine, or maybe making it like a D9 chord, that doesn't really change. How much does that really change that moment? Like not that much, right? So there's bigger things going on that are gonna help me to achieve more of an effect, right? The higher up I go on the musical DNA ladder, if I change a rhythm, right, if I change a melody, those things impact the music in a greater way. There is no greater way. <laughs> <laughs> I'm all over it, baby. Yeah. <laughs> but jokes aside. We'll talk comedy after. Yeah. Uh, anyway, um, I guess what I'm trying to say is that, um, you know, as far as an arrangement goes, like, that's one option. But what if I was thinking about, like, making it into, like, a samba chart? Okay, like, maybe... For an introduction and I'm, and I'm thinking about an introduction um, in my mind so I guess that means that really that would be one thing that I would write down is like okay let's start with an intro of some kind I'm tacitly saying that in my head right now but you know for what it's worth I think that saying that stuff into the space you know whether you just speak it or whether you write it down or it gets it out of your head too right there's all this stuff that gets jumbled up in our minds so if I'm starting with like maybe it's a samba or bossa let's say it's a bossa I don't know, maybe I'm hearing halftime now. I'm not mm. sure. So all of these ideas start to happen and then I, I pause and I go back. I was like, okay, so so if this is a, a bassa version, then what I just heard is B flat major seven for two measures. And then I heard a C sharp or D flat, depending on how crazy you are about anharmonic spelling, D flat over C flat. <laughs> um, which is technically correct in this case. And then I went back down to B flat major seven for two measures. And then I had one measure of, it's, I think it was D flat major seven with a 13. And then I had one measure of B seven with a 13 and a nine. So now I give this and I say, okay, now, now I decide to myself. Maybe I have, maybe that's what I needed. It's just like a little bit of a, an interlude, sort of like a two measure interlude, a hold on F. A little hearkening to the introduction there. Hearkening. Nice one, dude. Thanks, dude. Well said. Well said, indeed. <laughs> so, 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 like, as soon as the process starts to get going, like, 
you just have to have a system in place that allows you to write that stuff down because as you can tell, I'm keeping it very improvisational. Right? I'm just kind of uncovering. Those words. So, so what happens if no ideas are happening? What happens if you're sitting there? That's writer's block. Okay, so maybe try something else. Like think about what is not working about what you're writing and try and change that thing. Okay, you're not hearing anything with a bossa, try a swing. What about a waltz? <laughs> I don't like that, personally, <laughs> for, for myself. But um, I guess that involves some analyzation, which is okay, I found out soon. That's mm -hmm. fine, right? And so I'm open to that stuff too. Like if I don't like something, I'll be honest with myself right away. That makes sense. And does it doesn't make sense? Yeah, no, absolutely. I think it's important to just trust your instincts. Yeah. Like, oh, I don't like 100%. how that feels. Right? Yeah, absolutely. And then so so writing it down is um, this is where like I would never give what I just wrote down to a band. Sure, you're just sketching ideas, right? <laughs> exactly, getting yeah. it out of my head, and then I'll reorganize it later on in a lead sheet format. In or if in, I'm having a quintet gig, maybe I'll put out like a melody and a counter melody part and a solo page, right? Or if I have a, a sextet or a septet, maybe now I need like a couple of different horn parts and a rhythm section part. What if I have like a non-net? Now I, I definitely need an individual part for every person. And so the more people you add, the more specific you have to get, right? And so the further down that five-step process that we go. So let's say we had first two chords and I was gonna ask you right now, or I am going to ask you right now. <laughs> Great. To expand the first two chords to big band. Which ones? Let's say the B flat major to whatever you want to make the next one. I mean, you know, E flat seven, but if you wanted to change the harmony or anything. In other words, what if I asked you to basically harmonize the first uh, measure or first two measures and then expand it to big band? So, so the melody itself. Yeah, exactly. So. so I would decide first, like what, I would decide those other things first. I would decide on the vibe first that I'm going for. I would decide like the rhythm, the, the rhythmic approach. And then I would already have like, given that rhythmic information, I would have a way that I'm interpreting the melody that is unique and idiomatic to that feel. So I would have already done those things. And then in terms of the harmonic expansion, now I'm, I'm having an option of like, how do I, like, do I wanna harmonize that melody? Or do I want to like leave that melody as uh, as its own line? This is you know dependent in many ways on the rhythmic information that we've already decided upon earlier. Got it. Okay. So you choose a you choose. Let's let's make okay. this a collaborative. Let's make it a game. <laughs> sure. Sounds good. <laughs> Welcome to our game show. This is arrange a song right now. That would be a great game show. <laughs> I think that it would really get canceled very soon. I think you're probably right, but man, what I, I, that would get me watching reality TV for sure. <laughs> <laughs> reality. It's like the great B British Bake Off, but it's the great I love that. jazz arrange off. <laughs> I'm, I'm in. Channel idea. Channel TV idea. TV show. Um, <laughs> you heard but, it here. Now, before we continue, I just want to take a second to thank Casio again for sponsoring this episode. The keyboard in front of me is actually the Casio Privia PXS6000. This is part of their new Privia line. As you can see, this is just a visually gorgeous keyboard that I've been using for many months now, and I'm absolutely loving having it as my daily practice piano. They've taken the time to really make this a beautiful instrument to both look at and actually physically use. The key bed is really nice, it's fairly quiet. I love it, again, I've been practicing on it sometimes hours a day consistently, and it feels great on my hands. I feel like I've been making a lot of progress and I've always just enjoyed sitting down to play it. It also may sound silly, but for me, the visual aesthetic of an instrument is actually really, really important. And some of the details of this design have also really led to me loving this instrument even more. For example, there's actual spruce on the sides of the keys. Those little touches really help it feel like a real piano. There's also wood style paneling, which helps the aesthetic love these stands and of course the actual interface is all just controlled by touch with these little lights and it's just a really simple minimalistic looking keyboard again i've really fallen in love with this instrument as far as digital pianos go this is one of my favorites that i've used and one of the most comparable experiences that i've had to an actual real piano 
Huge thanks again to Casio for sponsoring today's video and supporting this kind of educational content. I hope you're getting a lot out of today's episode. And if you're interested in learning more about the Privia line, check out the affiliate link in the description of this video. And if you're streaming this podcast, you can also just go to noahkelman.com slash Casio and you will find the affiliate link there. All right, right back to the episode. Okay, so I'm going to elect that we actually arrange the melody itself, you know, apply whatever you might apply rhythmically and harmonically, and then expand it to uh, the big, you know, the typical big band format. Cool, so let's do this with a, a special kind of voicing. It's called the four-way closed position voicing, which is not unique to big band at all. It's also not unique to piano, but in order for there to be a four-way closed position voicing, by definition, you need two things. You need to have one, four different notes in that voicing, and number two, it needs to be held within the span of an octave. Those are the two things that a four-way closed position voicing needs in order to become a four-way closed position voicing. And so one of the reasons why I, I'm going to start there right now is that it's going to give me a really good opportunity to kind of look at the musical DNA up close of what we're actually going to be writing. So how do you play that first melody? Down to the B flat there. That's what I do. You ever hear people do that? I have, yeah. So interesting. Yeah, I, mean, I like that too. Okay, so now that I've gotten my first, um, I guess it's three measures technically. What I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna write down the chord symbols. Um, first measure is B flat, major seven. Second measure is E flat, seven. And usually people play a sharp 11 there. And then what do you play on that D natural? Do you play A flat, do you play D seven? Do you play D minor uh, seven? I like the A flat. You like the A flat? Yeah. Why do you like the A flat? It gives a sense of tension before resolving to the G7, I think. Yeah. For me, that's yeah. why I like it. Yeah, I like that too. Hmm. Yeah, and then that D natural is a common tone. Yeah, exactly. And it yeah. kind of sinks a little bit. I like that. <clears throat> yeah, and then we get the nice cycle of fourths action of the root. Yeah, exactly. So so now like it's, it, there's an interesting measure, which is the pickup measure. I'm, I'm going to leave that uh, alone for now. I'm just going to start on the B flat major seven. Now, there's so many different ways. And the way that I'm going to do right now is let's just call it the way to do, the way to jour, which is a way of the day. Um, and uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with the chord tones. So uh, a chord tone, by the way, is a any of the four notes that are implied by a chord symbol. And so a chord symbol is comprised of a chord symbol, like it has all the information that we could ever possibly need. And it implies a couple of different things. Number one, it implies four notes, right? So a chord symbol is, is built on root quality function and then tensions after that. Whereas the root defines the thing that uh, all the notes above it live, right? The quality defines if it's major or minor. In other words, is it happy or sad? The function defines where it's coming from, where it's going, where did it come from? Where did it go? Exactly. <laughs> um, and uh, we'll let you finish that one, everybody else. Um, and then the tension, you know, I, I, it's, it's sort of like, we just talked about like a sharp 11. That's one kind of tension, but there's also other kinds. There's nines, there's, there's 13s, there's alterations to those tensions, there's flat lines. There, those are color, color notes. Okay, so a chord symbol implies at least four notes, right? B flat major seven, B flat is my root. Okay, D is my major third, and my seven is going to be A natural, B flat major seven, right? So it has all of this data in the chord symbol already. All I have to do is take it out from that, right? And then in this case, it looks like the fifth is implied. But the chord symbol also implies one other thing, which is that it implies a scale. So I can take this chord symbol and sort of explode it into a scale format, right? Whereas instead of it being a snapshot picture, right? And what a snapshot picture it is. But I can take that and I can stretch it out, right? So if I imply time, right? Which is one of the things that rhythm does. Like it doesn't just tell us like, how do we interpret the eighth note? It also says that this note happens first, second, third, or fourth. Like that's an important thing to acknowledge that as, as true, as simple as it is, rhythm implies the passage of time. If rhythm implies the passage of time, then B flat major seven implies something that exists over a certain amount of time not just a chord, but also a scale. And so if I sort of fill in the blanks, literally, of what the scale is, then instead of just having four notes, I also can say, get seven notes. So I turn this into this. 
You hear that? Yeah. You hear the horn outside? Oh, that's what. No, <laughs> yeah. I didn't hear that. That's awesome. <laughs> okay. So, or maybe I'm hearing things. Who, who knows? So once I have this scale, I can say to myself, all right, every single note in this melody can be harmonized with one of the notes from the scale for the first measure. When I go to E flat seven, I can use a different scale there. And that chord symbol implies something else, right? If I use a root quality function tension formula, then E flat would be the root, right? G would be the quality. Let's just pause on the math for a second. The science, the root quality tension formula, what'd you call it? Root quality function formula. Oh. Did I say tension formula? I might've no, said No, 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 I, I, think you said said, I think you probably said function. Root quality function formula. Root quality function formula. Cool. All yeah. Right. And that's what it's what like. What is that? Well, yeah. Look at it. <laughs> wow, look at that. Right? And so we can see how it correlates with a chord symbol. So, so can you just walk us really quick through what that is, the root quality function formula? Yeah. It's basically a way of taking the information that already exists in a chord symbol and pulling out like every hmm. last drop of what it means. Hmm. Right? So harmony in terms of like how we present information on a lead sheet is presented by a chord symbol. Right? So, you know, we're both pianists. We know that when we see... Uh, a lead sheet that just has and some chord symbols, we're gonna be playing way more, or we can play way more than all that, that what exists there. When we orchestrate something for big band, all we're doing is we're writing that stuff that we naturally do down. So what if I have like, what if I wanted to play something in thirds? Okay, great, let's just write that down. What if I wanna play like, you know, Bill Evans style? Okay, I just write all that stuff down that I have in my head. Does that make sense? Yeah. What I, where I'm going with this? So, yeah, absolutely. So it's like, like I just want to demystify this process for everybody. And I think that it's so cool that we can do that. Like it's, it, there's, there's absolutely stuff that we need to work on in terms of the craft. In other words, the machinery, right? Because in terms of playing piano, we have this certain machinery. In terms of writing for large ensembles, like there's other machinery that's like a pen that we have to double tap sometimes. <laughs> Because we can't be perfect on the first goes. We have to need to erase it. 2023. 2023, baby. Okay, so looking at this melody. Okay, that B flat. There's very few ways that I can harmonize this. It is a chord tone, right? So a chord tone is one of the four notes that exists in this root quality function formula, right? So B flat on top. Now, if I go down to an A, I'm going to show you what happens. But that's the next note down in the chord symbol, right? B flat is the root. The next note down would be an A natural. That's the seven. The next note down from that would be an F, right? And then the next note down from that would be a D. And I'm left with this voicing, which is kind of nice, right? If I let it hang yeah. out. But I also have this tension at the top. The more I play it, the worse it gets. Hmm. This is a hard thing to tune, actually. So this is just part of the machinery. Right. So what I can do is I can move that note down to a G natural. And instead of having a major seven chord, I have a major six chord, okay? And that's totally fine, right? Why is it fine? It's because these notes already exist in the scale that this chord symbol implies. And so without kind of like going through that process for every single note in this melody, what I can do is I can go and I can say, okay, I have another chord tone on the second beat that's A natural, right? That's one way of harmonizing it, right? But it sounds a little clunky. Is there another thing that I can do? Because what am I going to do with this G now? Now, does this really communicate the B flat major chordscape? It sounds I don't, a bit more like a G minor. It sounds like a little bit more G minor. -y. So those are the decisions that you wind up having to make along the way. Interesting. And the faster you can get at that decision-making process, the faster you can do all of these things. Now I will admit that what I was hearing in my head when we first started doing this was an F pedal. And then I was hearing the saxophone do this. And maybe the trombones answer. And then maybe like the trumpets come in. Who doesn't like a good quote? What is that quote though? No idea. No idea, oh my God. <laughs> Save your applause for later, everybody. You're on fire. Trombones. Oh, my ideal. 
And then maybe it goes to like alto and trumpet, like bird and diz style. I would write to one of the instruments, okay, like alto, you take the lead for this, and then trumpet, you answer with some sort of, okay, and then for the second A section, maybe I have, and I'm, what I'm doing right now is I'm writing a word sketch in my, in my mind, right, for the second A, and maybe it's in two, maybe it's in a two field. Okay, so, so, I, so I, I'm starting to like hear all these things, and basically all I do to write them down is I'm, I'm gonna say F pedal, start with an F pedal, okay, and I'm just gonna say saxes first, and then bones, enter, and then we're going to have a walk down. That's what I did. I had a walk down from E minor 7 flat 5 um, with trumpets. My ideal, in quotes. That's just enough for me to, Beautiful. to, to have this idea going on. Okay, and then I'm going to say transition into A1, which is going to be, let's say, alto 1, melody, trumpet 3, answers. I'm going to say it's in two. And then uh, A1, I'm going to say maybe there's going to be some sax backgrounds. I'm not sure what kind of backgrounds. I'm, may, I'm, maybe I'm hearing pads. And then I'm going to say uh, trumpet three melody and alto one answers. And then it's a conversation. You know who I haven't spoken yet? It's trombone. So when we go to the bridge, let's have the trombone start. That's kind of high for the trombones, though. That's super, that's super low, so it can't be them. Okay, I'm gonna have to give it to somebody else. This really is... interesting though, right? You, we're seeing kind of your process of thinking of it a little bit more conceptually as this conversation, and then the mechanics come in, and you're like, well, that trombone idea isn't gonna work because the mechanics don't align. Absolutely, and just one quick aside there, which is that I already know there is no greater love, right? So. If I didn't know there is no greater love, what I would have done already up to this point is that I would have created my own lead sheet version of the arrangement, which includes an interpreted melody based on the rhythmic feel that I was hearing in my head when I first started. Interesting. And I write all that stuff down, get it out of my head. And it can change later on, but it helps to have some sort of a, a thing in place. Yeah, that's amazing. It, it reminds me a lot of, you know, something I've talked about with people about songwriting, for example. Um, and so, you know, especially when I was in my video game composition learning phase, one of the things I learned was coding and something we would do is pseudocode, which is instead of writing down actual code, mm -hmm. you would write down just with words, what is the code supposed to do? What is this line right. going to accomplish? What mm -hmm. is this, uh, you know, function going to do? And then once you had pseudocoded it, that allowed you to conceptualize it then you could get into the mechanics of the code itself. And same thing with songwriting. It's like, okay, I'm going to break this down. And before trying to write some amazing lyrics, let me actually think, what do I want each stanza to say? Or what do I want right. each line to actually mean? And does the line I've written actually mean that? You know, um, And it kind of seems like, in a way, that's what you're doing now on the I arranging composition perspective. Well, maybe I can take up coding. I don't know. Now I feel like I can do anything. You should. Did the camera just get that wink? <laughs> I hope so. I'm sure we got, we got it at some angle. Great. Yeah. No, I think that there's so many different similarities um, in all of these different, you know, the musical creation process, it sounds like can be applied to coding too. Um, but basically, you know, when I think about communicating a set of information to somebody, I'm trying to be cognizant of what the space is, what does the space require of me? What is the communication um, look like that's going to be the most helpful is it a spoken conversation between two old jazz camp friends you know is it you know is it a youtube video you know i there, there's things that were that we're being cognizant of in, in all of these different places in this case i'm being cognizant of okay well this arrangement that i just wrote i don't need to have any of the alto one alto two trumpet three melody answer counter melody backgrounds if I'm writing a lead sheet, all I need is to say, okay, let's start. And I'm going to tell everybody, like, when we get up, like, it's our first time playing There Is No Greater Love. I'm going to sell, tell, tell the trio, hey, guys, let's just start with an F pedal over here. And then let's, um, let's do a little walk down, maybe, you know, and someone's going to say, okay, they're going to start to get a little scared. Okay, like, scratch the walk down. Or, you know, depending on the comfort level of the trio, you know, like, being cognizant. 
of, of the space that you're in, the people that you're playing with. Um, and being malleable, it seems like. Yeah, and then I'll say, okay, like on the A sections, let's let's do a two feel. And then on the bridge, let's go to four. And, so, and then I'll stop there and someone might ask like, oh, should we stay in two or should we stay in four or should we go back to two for the last day? Um, we're like, mm, that's a good question. What do you think? Conversation, right? Allowing everybody to be themselves in the best way possible. A common misconception about writing orchestrated music for a big band or orchestra is that we have all of these 18 people in a big band, all of these 120 people in a symphony orchestra who have two jobs to do. They have to read the part that they're given and be a part of the bigger team as a whole. And especially in jazz, which is an improvised art form that is created in the moment most of the time, people are adding their personality to the music. And we need to write the music in a certain way that allows everybody to be themselves, make them feel confident, rather allow them to feel confident, not make them feel confident. Um, although not not make them feel com confident. And yeah, I mean, the, there's so many different places that this conversation can go. It's, but, it, but, but ultimately, you know, <clears throat> the, the, the conversation that we've had today about composition, you know, I, I hope can, can help unlock uh, or rather remove some some inhibitions that, that folks out there might have about writing um, because, you know, I'll be the first to say, like, I understand where those things come from, having experienced them myself. Of course, like every composer out there in the world has experienced in some point in their life some difficulties with composing, right? It's that connection of arts and crafts that we were talking about. And so I really hope that for anybody out there who's really interested in composing and arranging, whether it's for a trio or whether it's for a big band or orchestra or anywhere in between, that those inhibitions can be removed and that you're one step closer to just kind of finding a path to help you get there. And you, you do need a, a path to help you get there. You know, you're such an incredible teacher, man. I'm a fan of the videos that you put out and, and I watch them and I love hearing like how you break down these these concepts. And, you know, I, I think that that everybody needs some sort of a, a mentor to kind of help them along their path and realize like, you know, that they have something valid and valuable and important to say with the machinery that they're using, whether that machinery is writing for a piano trio, solo piano, big band, whatever it is. Um, and that, that's, what I, that's what I really love to do is I really love to help students unlock that, that potential um, because I do believe that everybody has it. Um, so beautifully said. And on that note, where can students find you so that they can actually work with you to learn composition and arranging and piano in general? Yeah, um, well, thanks. Uh, just my website, I guess, which Amazing. is stephenfeifemusic.com. Awesome, I'll make sure to yeah. put that up on screen for anyone who's watching, but for anyone who is just listening, Stephen, S-T-E-V-E-N-F-E-I-F-K-E music.com. Yeah. Stephenfeifemusic.com. Thanks, Noah. Awesome, What's your, uh, what, what are your social handles? At Stephen Feifke. Amazing. Across the board. Great, great. Well, that was, yeah, that was such a beautiful, beautiful message. And I think as people, you know, we have absolutely been in those places where we yeah. were the, the kids at jazz camp or, or who, who looked up to people and had no idea how yeah. they were accomplishing it or achieving it. And I think one thing I like to express is like, there's no rush to become the greatest anything really there's no rush take your time enjoy the journey make progress every day because at some point if you just do that if you just move forward a little bit every single day you will be the one sitting with a grammy award composing you know on the podcast or whatever what you know doing much cooler things whatever um <laughs> but amazing man well thank you so much that was an unbelievable lesson Few other things I would love to ask you about, Stephen, while we've got you here. Let's so, see. <laughs> first of all, in addition to being a fantastic composer and arranger, oh, stop. No, seriously, no, it's, it's, gonna... it's true. It's Thank true. You. No, I appreciate. Um, at least the Grammy Grammy judges think so. I'm not saying I think so, but the Grammy judges think so. At least. Um, so, <laughs> in addition to that, you're also obviously a fabulous pianist, a highly accomplished pianist. So, thank you, man. I am curious. Have there been any specific moments in your development as a pianist, 
on the technical level, any specific moments, like lessons you've learned or exercises that you remember practicing for an extended period of time that had a huge impact on your ability? Oh man, well, the biggest moment that I had, that was like the most impactful moment that I had as a pianist was when I was 17, practicing for college auditions. And it was the first time in my life I'd over practiced and I got tendonitis and I could not play piano for six months. I remember like I had an audition at Eastman, I, I, which by the way, I did not get into. And um, I, w I went in with braces. I, I like, I was, ser you know, I was seriously injured. Um, and it happened at, a, at such a young age that it really reformed my, my playing completely. And I started to look at the ways that different pianists played the instrument with a very uh, analytical eye, I guess. You know, you see someone like Bill Evans who has like, who plays like very flat handed. You, know, you see someone like Brad Meldow who has like perfect, God, I hate it. No, I'm just kidding. It's a <laughs> perfect, like, but, but perfect technique. Yeah, like Brad, could you please yeah, just you leave less. something for the rest of us? And then you see people like Sullivan Fortner who's just like, man, each finger is like its own entity it's just crazy um and uh you know and then there's the classical cats too like glenn gold comes to mind um and so i started to look at and so i, I started to say to myself okay when, okay mccoy I, I gotta point out mccoy like his thumb was actually like a little bit he, he had such an interestingly shaped thumb i can't even really do it but like it'll i think that that's part of the reason maybe that he invented the style of playing that he did. And I'll, I'll, I'll go on record saying McCoy invented a, a thing. Oh, I completely um, agree with you. I think yeah. he's one of the most unique pianists that we've had. Yeah, I totally agree. And I, then I started to realize that these pianists are people, are humans, and they have, it sounds silly, but they have bodies. And everybody's body is different. And there is a great video that I watched in 2013. Actually, you were in Grammy Dance. You might have been there for this show at the Grammys, Lang Lang and Herbie playing Rhapsody in Blue together. Is it horrible if I don't remember? No, it just might not have been the year you did it. <laughs> or maybe it was. <laughs> I don't know. 2013, no, 2009, 2008. 2008 or nine. 2008. No, 2009, early 2009. That probably was the year I did it. Yeah. And I do remember McCoy being there. Yeah. At least I remember McCoy being somewhere that I was. Well, that's cool. For the record, I do not have a great memory. That is not my strong suit. <laughs> Man, I, just a quick story about McCoy. I used to intern at the Blue Note when I was at college. I went to NYU and they hooked me up with a nice internship at the Blue Note. And one of my jobs for the summer that I worked there was working for the Summer Jazz Festival, the Blue Note Summer Jazz Festival. And I got the chance to basically be for a a hot second McCoy's roadie. Um, not really roadie because there's nothing to pack up. Um, you know, he plays piano. I remember like I would like help him on and off stage and oh man, I, you know, I, I, McCoy was, I think actually the, the third pianist who I ever listened to. My, I had a great teacher. Her name was Susan Capestro. I talk about her all the time. She's one of the most impactful teachers I ever had. And she bought me these records, which she didn't have to do. She bought me the Atomic Count Basie. She's like, listen to this, see if you like this. I was like, I love this. And she's like, okay, listen to this. And she got me a Winton Kelly Sextet CD. Like how many Winton Kelly Sextet CDs are there? That's I think where I get, and Benny Golson is on flute on that record. Um, I think that's where I get my love of the flute from. And I do love the flute, one of my favorite instruments. And then she got me a bunch of McCoy records. She got me um, Infinity, which is the record with, with Michael Brecker on it and Soliloquy, which is a solo piano record. Oh man. So I remember there was one day when I was working at the Blue Note Summer Jazz Festival and <clears throat> McCoy's manager like pulls me aside. And he's like, hey, quick question for you. I'm like, what? <laughs> I was so nervous. I was like, what? And um, he's like, can you get McCoy a coffee? And I was like, yes, I can. Absolutely. And the guy handed me McCoy's credit card. He was like, okay, here you go. And I was like, McCoy Tyner. I got him a coffee and I hand McCoy the coffee. Here you go, Mr. Tyner. He was like, thank you. And, uh, <laughs> and I don't know. I'm, you know, McCoy for the way that he played the piano was just uh, the way that I knew him, which I think was quite limited. Um, you know, I, I was an intern at a summer jazz festival and I was like tangentially helping this guy out. Um, 
he seemed so calm and gentle. And that was a very beautiful thing for me as a 21 year old pianist to witness just this giant being so kind and soft spoken and playing the piano in this like huge way. And just going back to what we were talking about before, like McCoy was a big dude, you know, he's a big guy. And, and uh, I think that part of the reason why he had the sound that he had um, is because of his body and um, because of who he was. And, you know, in all of the parts, you know, in, in terms of like what he was in his mind, who he was in his soul and the body that he had. And whether you're looking at Bill Evans' technique and you're saying, okay, this is one way of playing the piano, or whether you're looking at Brad Meldon and you're saying, okay, this is another way of playing the piano. I think that, you know, and I'll get back to the tendonitis thing in a second and, and the exercise that I, that I want to share, but <clears throat> the, but the thing that I noticed then was just like how much of their bodies they were using when they were playing the piano. Uh, I started off classically trained, um, but you know, I decided I hated it when I was nine years old. Um, I just couldn't, in my opinion, at that point in time, make the music come off the page and come alive in the way that I could if I was just sitting down at the piano and playing my music, which is improvisation, which is why Susan was so impactful for me, Susan Capestro, because she really helped me to get in touch with that compositional thing and from a very early age removed inhibitions that I think I might have otherwise encountered along the way. And yeah, I, um, I think that, you know, as soon as I started to realize like how much of the, like Bill Evans, or we think about the posture, we think about like, you know, he's his hand, like, like the bench would be a lot lower than it is right now. And he'd basically be like, be like at eye level with the instrument and his hands would be coming up like this and his hands would be flat. And that means that the gravity of his elbows are pulling down his hands. Right? And so it's very, it's very much like, so like a waterfall. Like when I think about Bill Evans, I think about a waterfall. When I think about um, McCoy, right? I think about. Right, he does this thing. Where he goes like the hand slap, sometimes goes over the arm, but sometimes I went under. Yeah, a little different than my calling, but regardless, you know, everybody's got their, their, their thing. And so as soon as I started to notice that, I said, okay, I just need to actually need to connect with my body. And so I studied with a physical therapist. Um, and I'm lucky my mom is actually a physical therapist and she was my very first piano teacher. I started playing when I was four and she was such an incredible teacher. She just really made it so fun for me. And um, I remember working on, she taught me like the cat song, which I don't remember how it goes, but I know that it was like tiptoe like a cat. And, you know, and I, I remember saying like staccato, it's like a stove. And I'm like, oh, careful. You know? mm. And um, and then later on when I was 17, 18 years old, when I had tendonitis and I was coming out of it and I was able to start playing the piano again, because the tendonitis was so bad that I actually developed what's called radial ulnar, ulnar neuropathy. Radial ulnar neuropathy, which is where your nerves in your elbow gets pinched. It's it's also known as tennis elbow, but those are two slightly different things, I think. I'm not a doctor, so someone check me on that, or don't. But regardless, like your nerve gets pinched and you start to feel tingling in your fingers. And the tendonitis was, my tendons were so inflamed that the doctors said like, it's better if you just stop. And I got like really um, ergonomic keyboards and mouse. I know this is a long lead up to the exercise, but I no, started working right. with this guy, Doug Johnson, a pianist. I remember Doug, yeah. Yeah, right, from, Berkeley, from right? the Berkeley, yeah. Yep. Yeah, amazing teacher. Yeah. I only had a couple lessons with him, but I remember yep. learning a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. let's sing Doug's praises for a yeah. second. I mean, he's, he's very incredible. Doug, teacher. And he really understood the body in a way that as a teacher, he taught me this awareness of my body. I'm, I'm even noticing it right now. I'm like trying to fix my posture, but like he taught me that playing the piano doesn't, doesn't start at your fingers. It actually starts at your feet. <laughs> and like, like, if I'm like, honest, like I've been a bad student for, for the last however long we've been talking. And yeah, so like definitely. when we sit from our seat, from we, when we sit from our feet in our seat, <laughs> write that one down. Yeah. You better, um, <laughs> you know, 
now I have a strong foundation. I, I like my, 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 my feet are, and actually like I would preferably have this, this seat lower. Like I would do other things. Like if, if I was in a performance situation right. that would make me feel comfortable and confident in the same way that writing music would make a performer in an ensemble feel confident and blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. So I've got my feet supporting myself. I, I'm actually like, I could like stand up. I, I can, right. I can go and throw the gravity baseball. is supported. Yeah. And so, this is the this is getting to the interesting thing. As soon as I have my 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 body weight supported for my feet, and of course I'm using the the chair, right? I've got my mm -hmm. core activated in some sort of unconscious way. Although at some point I did have to think about it. Now I notice that okay, my my arms actually start at my shoulders, right? And I can feel my shoulder blades pinching together as I'm pulling them back further and further. And so I'm opening myself up right now, and I just hold this. Because I, you know, I think that in this today, today's day and age, like we're all on our phones all the time. And for what it's worth, everybody, like I, I actually do this. Like I actually open myself up and I just hold myself like this. I try and have straight arms face the sky. And I just try and open up my body because everything is involved when you're playing the piano. And I'm just trying to, what I'm trying to do right now is I'm trying to get loose. I was trying to, and I'm trying to also have like awareness of like, what are my feet doing right now? Are my feet still like from, am I supporting myself? Yes, I am. Okay, good. Right. And so I started to have this connectivity with my, with my body. And now I, I'm starting to feel a little bit loose and I'm just kind of like shaking out the energy because like how many of us are just like on our phones going like this all day. And even if you're not like that, first of all, incredible, teach me your ways. And, so, and second of all, like now, like, I, like everybody, if you, if you just did this exercise with us and this is one part of the exercise, like, do you feel more open? Like this is, this is an honest question that I want you to ask yourselves because this is really such an important part of the process. And it's one of the least talked about parts of playing the piano Absolutely. is the body, the way that the body interacts with the instrument. And it's a misconception that a lot of people don't address because we don't have to use our lungs like a saxophonist does, right? So one thing that this is getting away from the point, but I am going to go there really quickly that gets talked about as, a, as in terms of jazz improvisation is like, don't overplay like take breaths, like as a pianist, like I could never figure out what that meant because I didn't actually need to breathe to play my instrument. What I realized it meant is that instrumentalists like saxophonists and trumpet players and trombonists that are actually using their voices, their physical voices, the same technology, same machinery that they use to talk, they take breaths naturally, but pianists, we don't do that, right? And so I think that along the way, we start to ignore in some capacity, we start to ignore the physicality of the instrument. And so this gets us, now we've, now we've basically focused on the feet, legs, butt, core, shoulders, or shoulder blades, really, chest, open, arms. And now I'm starting to get into this place where I can start to use my, my hands. And so what I'm doing right now is I'm actually dropping my hands. So I'm picking it up, and I'm just dropping it. And this is an exercise that I do with my students is that I, I, I tell them to, to put their hands on the keyboard. And then I, I go over to them and I, and I shake their arm like this. Do you mind if I Please, come over there? By all means. Okay, so hold your hand as though you're gonna play. Okay, so you're like, you're, you're really good. Like you are super loose, right? And so what this does is that when I pick up your hand, I'm gonna pick up your hand in just a second. I want you to just let it fall and catch yourself on some key. Okay, so fall all the way through. Yeah, and catch yourself on like a, some sort of triad. So, okay, sorry, I'm trying. <laughs> sorry. Okay, there then. went my joints. <laughs> oh my God, I, I've injured him. <laughs> Oh no, Jazz Lab, emergency. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so like if I do this to myself and I catch myself, I started to realize I can, I can, there's more power in the weight that my arms contain. My arm is like, what, 10 pounds? Right. 20 pounds even? I don't know. Um, five pounds, whatever. Like, can you imagine like dropping a five pound weight on the piano? Like that would break the thing. Guys, before we started today, I had my ring resting here in Noah's head. This thing catches, it scratches super easily. So we're not going to drop a five pound weight on it. But please don't. As, as an analogy, if we did, right, like this thing, it, like my arm is it, like I can, if I push, first of all, it's aggressive. Second of all, like if I fall, I have more power. I, I am, I'm actually falling. You want to, you, you can come here, like here, lift my arm. Lift, yeah, yeah, your, your let's do it. Yeah, so just like, I'm, I'm super loose. So okay, just, so you want me to lift your arm yeah, and drop uh, it on the keys? Yeah. Cool. Nice, fall right on the triad. Yeah, love it. Yeah, and this is an exercise that you you know it's it's helpful to have a friend. Yeah, um, sure. but you can do this by yourself as well. And as soon as you start to get that 
power, you start, I started to realize that, you know, it's not super conducive to playing the piano to constantly think about picking up your hand and letting it fall. Right. And so if we watch, if we watch, watch, if we watch somebody like Bud Powell play, what he's doing is he's actually like, he's like oscillating his hand. So I'm like letting my finger fall. And you can hear like I'm getting this it like this amazing bebop phrasing already. And I'm exaggerating it right now. I'm trying to be super Yeah, yeah. I'm trying I'm trying to be like super exaggerated about the way I'm mm. doing it. I'm not being accurate with the notes, right? But my fingers are meant for catching, my hand is meant for falling. Mm. Think about that. Been a while since I played this. What other chord is this? It's got to be this. Okay, fifth, really. I tried. Cool. Nicer. Okay, so so like, but that but that exercise. So you can start rolling your hand. Just roll, just roll it. Go the other direction. My goal here is not accuracy. My goal here is not perfection. My goal is basically just to like get used to feeling my hand in this new way. Okay, so that's one way of thinking about the exercise. The other way of thinking about the, the exercise is to think about you, the way that you play the, the key in a circle. This is a Doug Johnson thing. This is that teacher that we just talked about. Is that every note has like a beginning and an end to it somehow. That was not what I wanted to play, but let's just go with it. So these are two exercises that I would really, really suggest. Number, and I guess three, right? Just think of like, have that full body awareness, right? Yoga, piano, piano, yoga, yoga, piano. <laughs> It's just, it's, <laughs> these are not good. No, this is good. This is really good. Yeah, this is the. Kyogo was invented on Jazz Love. Yeah, <laughs> this is the content. This is not the content you are looking for. Um, this is John Williams now. Um, anyway, yeah, so the full body awareness start with your feet, build up from there, open yourself up, let your, your hand fall. That's all one exercise. And number two is to, is to make that smaller and have your. And, and this song that, we're, that I'm playing right now, I cannot think of the name. Bouncing with Bud? Something like that. I think it's yeah. Bouncing, Bouncing with Bud. Um, it's a really good one to try because it starts with a B flat major scale, starting on the Fa, on the E flat. And it's very, you know, and it's also got some awesome bebop language in this. Mm -hmm. And it might not look to you guys like I'm like I'm falling, and that's correct because actually in the process of getting ready for the next attack, I'm actually I'm actually picking up my hand. And that's giving me some nice inflection. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's giving me some nice contour dynamically to the line. It's not just the notes themselves. It's now it's now I'm thinking about this physically, dynamically. Dynamic in this case referring to volume. Love it. Cool. Thanks. Amazing. I'm curious um, about your exercise, your, your exercise, your one. Oh, that is a great question. I think, you know, if I had to choose one exercise, the funny thing is my exercises have been shown on this channel quite a bit on my YouTube channel. Um, and where can people go to find that Yeah, you could go to here. <laughs> yeah, to you, actually, that. you're already yeah, in this spot. Yeah. Actually, leave this, but no, don't leave it. But Well, if you happen to be listening on the streaming platforms, then yes, you can go to youtube.com slash Noah Kelman, of course. Um, amazing. And that's um, N-O-A-H. Yes, thank you. K-E-L-L-M-A-M. -L -L -M. Exactly. Thank you. Exactly. <laughs> Not to be confused with Kellerman. Oh, is there another Very common. No. No, but that is what I You should get, get that channel too. I usually, I, maybe I should. Yeah. Because that's what everyone searches probably. <laughs> I can't find Noah Kellerman. Where is he? <laughs> so as you know, I did have a lot of tendencies. I do know that. It's something that we've talked about a lot. Yeah. Length, and, actually. and lately I've been working with 
um, actually someone who's kind of part of my team, but who has also become my teacher. Mm. And his name is Matt Tabor, and he is a body mapping coach. Oh, wow. So I don't know if you've heard of body mapping, but it's really interesting. You know, it definitely dives into some of what we've been chatting about right now. Wow. And a huge part of it is body awareness. Mm -hmm. So actually knowing the physiology of your body yep. and where tendons connect, where bones connect, where are the gravity centers? Yeah. You know, where does your arm actually connect yep. to the back or the shoulder, you know, all that yeah. kind of stuff. So it's really awesome. Really interesting. Very, very important stuff. So Super at some point I hope to have him on here too and just oh, do a full deep dive into body mapping, which I think will be cool. I think that that would be super cool. Yeah. Yeah. Noah, um, Noah Kellerman .com, right? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> For all things body mapping related. Exactly. Um, Bob body mappering. So no, okay, that, I'm done. I'm, I'm done. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, so yeah, I think if I had to answer your question right off the bat, yeah, I would sure. probably say the exercises that changed my life were the mental exercises. Mm. So the stuff that I had to work on when I couldn't play, when I couldn't physically play. That's interesting. So, you know, things like to learn voicings, I would just kind of play the first note and then be like, one, three, five, seven, nine, sharp, 11, 13, flat nine. Flat nine? <laughs> yeah. You mean sharper? Oh no, you do mean, you do mean flat nine. I think about that as sharp 15. Oh, interesting, wow. Because a flat nine chord implies less space of it. Did. Not yeah, no, no, I know what you mean. At, at that point, we're, I really start to think of it as polychords, but yeah, yeah, as D major um, seven over C major. Exactly. Yeah, and then what would be the next thing up from there? Would you go up another minor third? Or you Personally, go, I might go up to the F. What about an E major seven chord on top? I love it. Yeah, and then wow, wow. Yeah. This is something I got from Jim McNeely. From who? Jim McNeely. Oh, cool. Can you walk us through that? That's very cool. That's Jim's thing. Okay. I, 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 I mean, you're giving credit where credit is due. I, Jim's, Jim's thing right, right there is, is just masterful. And he has a whole record um, called Barefoot Dances and Other Visions where he really explores that harmonic landscape and, and the tools that he's using there. Cool. Jim would be the best person to talk about this. Sounds great. But what I'm doing right here is I'm playing an altered scale in both directions at once. And I'm filling in the gaps mm. in certain ways. That, that's 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 a gym thing. I love that. Yeah, that's very very cool. Yeah, I might, I might have to have a chat with Jim about that. That'd be really cool. I'll be there for that one too. Amazing. <clears throat> Sounds great. Well, okay, let's do a little speed round here. Speed it up. All right. Whatever. Three favorite most influential pianists. Wow. Um, impossible. <laughs> Truly. But okay, if you had to choose. The three that have had the biggest impact on you, and you can waver a little bit if you need to throw in a couple extra. Oh, wow, thank you. That is so generous. <laughs> um, Noah Kellerman, just right off the bat, comes to mind. He's great. He's great, right? I don't know I, him but personally. I can't find him online as hard as I look for him. <laughs> anyway, um, no, I, I guess um, the first pianist who I listened to, um, being that they were Count Basie, Winton Kelly, and McCoy Tyner. Um, I think had a profound impact on me just by nature of the fact that they were the first pianists that I ever heard intentionally in jazz. And I think that there, that word intentionally is something that I'm, I'm sure, you know, that, is, that, that has been spoken about many times before, but you know, on this channel, maybe even, but intentionality is, is so vitally important because you can hear something and it's just there you know, as like elevator background music, even if it's the most killing music you've ever heard. But as soon as you intentionally listen to something, then it becomes a part of you, whether you like it or not. And that's true. That's, that's just true. It does become a part of you. And, you know, I intentionally listened to those pianists. I, I didn't know any other music. That was it. So for a couple of years from the ages of nine to, I guess, 11 or 12, like I, you know, I listened to those you know, as a kid, I, I wasn't listening every day. You know, I was just like, my teacher said, listen to this. I was like, okay. <laughs> and I trusted her because she was my teacher and she was great, Susan. And I guess, you know, then it, then I, the door started to, to open from there. And, you know, I, I checked out Oscar Peterson. I checked out Gene Harris. I, I checked out um, Makoto Ozone. Um, and then I checked out, um, man, I, I used to think that, um, 
I probably shouldn't tell this, but I, I didn't know who certain artists were. Um, and so I used to listen to records and not know who the pianist was. Um, I think we've all been there. Yeah. It's, you should be proud that you just admitted it. Yeah. Um, but you know, now I intentionally go and find if I like somebody's music, or, you know, if I like it, I, I intentionally go and listen and find whoever's on the record. And I say, okay, now I know these people. And so an instance that this happened in my early adult life around 23, 24 is that I, I heard an awesome record by Dizzy Reese, that Jerry Weldon, the great tenor saxophonist. I, I went to go hear him one time. He was playing at an organ bar uptown in Harlem. And, um, I was talking to him after the gig and, you know, we're not close or anything like that, but I really admire and respect him musically. And I was asking him like some questions about Dexter Gordon and this guy, Dizzy Reese, his name came up and Dizzy is a incredible trumpet player. And it's like, you know, Dizzy Reese. I'm like, no, he's like, you gotta know Dizzy Reese. It's like, what record should I check out? He goes, Starbright. I said, okay, went home, checked out Starbright. I'm like, man, this pianist is killing. I look up who's on the record. It's Paul Chambers on bass. It's Art Taylor on drums. Hank Mobley's on tenor. Dizzy Reese is on. Who's on? Who's on piano? It's Winton Kelly. I'm like, all right. Like that's my go. that's my dude right there. So you know I, that's why I say like these things are so impactful. Uh, the, you know the first pianist that I listen to, they have to be. They just have to be a huge part of my music, my musical identity. Basie, Winton Kelly, and and um, McCoy Tyner. Those are the Amazing. first three. But I really, I, I love Oscar Peterson. I love the arrangements that, that, he, that he has with his trio. I just think that they're so incredible. Um, uh, who did I say next? Gene Harris, Pittsburgh, come on. Makoto Ozone is a contemporary piano player, Japanese guy, absolutely phenomenal. I don't know his music at all. Man, highly recommend you check it. How, check how it do out. we spell that if we want to look it up? M-A-K-O-T-O, O-Z-O-N-E, awesome. Makoto Ozone. Yeah, and he's played with everybody. Um, Donnie McCaslin, Michael Brecker, Gary Burton. His own music is just like, I love. Um, also a pianist with a trio and a big band. I, I was super inspired when I'm, I he, my He went to college with my high school band director and I met him when I was in ninth grade when I was a freshman. And it was a very important meeting for me. Awesome. And I can keep going and, 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 I, and I will for a short time, um, Errol Garner as someone who comes to mind, as someone who I just really love their music very deeply. And I love the way that he looks when he plays as well. He's just, he just always seems so happy. Having a great time. Yeah, um, smiling from ear to ear. Great arrangement of I Get a Kick Out of You. Ahmad Jamal, absolutely incredible. Bill Evans, we already spoke about earlier. Herbie Hancock. And, you know, these, these names are in no particular order whatsoever, but I worked with a fantastic teacher, uh, so many fantastic teachers, um, but um, I did work with Jim, one of my, you know, pianistic and compositional, you know, truly idols. And when I was at on my undergrad, I worked with Gil Goldstein, who studied with Bill Evans. Wow. And, um, and that was incredible. Um, not a lot of people really know uh, Gil's playing, but, you know, his, you know, he's written for Michael Breck, he's written for Chris Bodie, like everybody. And his playing is also just phenomenal. And so I guess like it's really hard to pick three. What, what am I at? Nine, 10, 11, 12 now. It's so good. Let me keep going because you know, <laughs> okay, I'm but, already on the, on the loop. Just for the sake of time, let's uh, do a quick round. Ones. Actual speed round. Okay. Starting now. Okay. Next question then. But let me just okay. say, <laughs> I, I, I mean, come on, like Brad Maldow, Gerald Clayton, Aaron Parks. I mean, just the, Peter Martin, like, I don't know, man. It's, it's Cyrus Chestnut. Uh, you, someone stop me. <laughs> I'll stop myself. <laughs> All right, I will stop you. Okay. okay, same thing, but three most influential arrangers. Oh my God, dude. Speed round. The, I, I don't know. I, I guess, um, you know, the first record that I got at Basie is Neil Hefty writing. Uh, so again, if we go by that role, it's like the early or you, the earlier you listen to something in your development, the, yeah, I don't know. Duke Ellington, Thad Jones, Maria Schneider, Gil Evans, Vince Mendoza, Jim McNeely, Gil Goldstein. I, 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 can't, Beautiful. I can't stop, man. You just did it though. You just, that was, Mar that was Mar perfect. I got it. I got Marty Page. I, I, I don't know, man. I love it. No, I love it. That was great. Thank you. Okay. Uh, three voicing sounds that you find interesting. 
Can you give me an example of a voicing sound that you like so I know how to Yeah, sure, question? sure. Here's, here's one that I like. It's just... And what makes that... Sus, the sus4, the major with the sus4. And what makes that so special for you? Or actually, sorry, this would be a major add for. <laughs> right? <laughs> Thanks, professor. <laughs> okay. <laughs> With three what makes it special? That I like. Yeah, I, what makes it I special? I think for me, it's just, it's one of those things that's a little unexpected. So, you know, I guess when I say, say special sounds, maybe a sound that's not part of the typical jazz canon, but it can be, right? I mean, Man, I love a minor I, 11. I love that. You know, I took a lesson with Taylor Eichsty recently, and um, yeah, that's- Always like, a good thing to do. Yeah, you gotta take lessons. How, how do you not take lessons? You do, lessons. You I gotta, gotta take, take more lessons. lessons. Yeah. Man, and Taylor is just incredible. Come incredible. on, I forgot to add, add Taylor to oh that. Oh my God, he's list. so incredible. Yeah, yeah, he's really, what a G. Yeah. Um, and, and in my, he, he, was, he was telling me, he was like, you know, your left hand voicings are great, but like, you know, like you should try some other structures. Like what about some guitar type voicings? And I was like, what does that mean? He was like, well, try this. And he was like, you know, the guitar has a certain way of playing. And I think about this stuff as an arranger, but somehow I didn't think about it as a pianist. I was like, wow, like, you know, core memory unlocked or whatever the kids are saying these days, <laughs> you know, but, you know, I have these, 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 these sounds. I'm, I'm just messing around with your voicing now, which I really like. You're right, it is so special. It's nice, right? I whispered. That means it's really, really special. It's really special. So I, I don't know. You know, I think that um, I, I really don't know how to answer your question. Um, I, I think that I think that I think of voicings very differently. I think of voicings as a representation of a harmonic landscape, and we can choose to perceive that as a vertical moment in time, in which case it's a chord, or we can think about it as like a soundscape that happens over over time. And so in that way, you know, as a pianist, I oftentimes think about it as like in I think about the piano as an orchestra, like the different, different registers of the piano have different identities. Different registers of the orchestra have different identities. Different registers of the harmonic uh, frequency spectrum have different identities. Like if I play something super low, no matter what note it is, we can see on the video and also it's a keyboard. So like, we're not gonna hear like the true overtone series, but this overtone series is so dense. that we don't really get to hear all that stuff, but on a piano, if you play that low note, it's not immediately perceptible as an A, right? It's, it, it, like, sometimes it, it can feel a little bit sharp, and that's because you're actually hearing some of those other overtones. It's so cool! Yeah. But that means that we can't play that same, that special voicing that you, that you said you like down there. And actually the fact that I can sort of actually hear like a couple of these notes in the voicing like is wrong. I shouldn't be able to hear that, which is kind of interesting. And if I play it up here, like now it's, you know, now it's just a texture. So I think about harmony first, voicing second. Makes sense. And um, very cool answer. Okay, great. Speed round. I guess one of the first voicings that sort of unlocked some stuff for me, I guess, was, was a voicing like this. That's Love basically it. a major triad and second inversion with a major second beneath it. Beautiful. Yeah, I like the sound. Major and it's, seven, and it's, very, sus two. it's very flexible, sure. Well, suspended is, I don't know, suspended underneath something. That's what suspended means. We have a sus four. That means right. it's suspended over the third. So, so it's like add two, omit three. Sure. Or yeah. maybe, it's, maybe it's the same voicing that you chose in a different inversion. Mm, I love it. So perspective. You know, yeah, it's, it's super there you important. go. School, I just got schooled. I love it. But what, no, you didn't get schooled. <laughs> but like, what's cool about a voicing in general is that like, the root changes everything. So I can use this chord, like, okay, you just said it's major add two or sus two. So like, let's just say it's, let's just say it's over A flat. Okay, that sounds a certain way. What if I have it over, over E flat? Now it's the voicing that you chose, right? Or the, the, the inversion, you know, what if I have it over D flat? What have I, <laughs> what if I have it over E? Right now I've got like, it's a different energy entirely. It's so cool, what about over C? Now I'm using the same voice and I'm just moving the, road, the root around. The Dave and David play and I put him on the root. <laughs> That's an old school YouTube one right there.
wow, that D just emerged. Okay, yeah, and I think about things as emerging, as like being uncovered. Like I, I did a study abroad program when I was in college at, uh, at a university and at a, at a campus in, in Florence, Italy. And um, I, I, every day I went to the, the Academia and the Uffizi, every day that I could. And I really did. And I really, I, and when I was there, there's, you know, there's the, the statue of all statues, the sculpture of all sculptures, which is the David, Michelangelo's David. And it's absolutely beautiful, but along, and I think that the academia is so brilliant for organizing the museum like this, because in order to get to the David, you have to walk through a passageway of Michelangelo's failed, incomplete statues. And there's a famous Michelangelo quote that says that when he, he was asked at some point, like, how do you think about sculpting? And he says, well, the statue already exists in the marble. It's just my job to liberate it. Beautiful. And so when I, when I just said right now, and I'm really not comparing myself to Michelangelo. I'm just a huge fan of this quote. Too late. No, I didn't do it. You, <laughs> you heard me. I didn't do it. But when I said that D just emerged, like it truly did. But I, you, you guys all heard me, right? I was playing a D flat in the bass. Like D natural is no, no place in that unless it's the sharp 15. Here we go. Okay, so like, is this a slash chord? Is this chord symbol from D flat over D flat? Do I like it? I'm not sure. Like it's, it's a little bit, I usually prefer like a little bit more space in the, in the slash chord. What does that mean? I prefer a little bit more space between the upper structure triad and the, so this is basically a G augmented major seven chord, right? But I can write it as a B flat over G over G flat. But what if I write B flat over D flat? Now, like, where does that triad begin? Whereas the B flat on the G flat starts on a chord tone. It starts on a chord tone, right? So it's it's immediately more strong. If I started on a D flat, it's beautiful, very open. If I started on an F, a chord tone. Right. I have all these different identities. I, I just, come on, it's, it's, the harmony is so cool, right? And so in terms of like what voicing, this unlocked a lot of perspective, but it's perspective, not the voicing, that I would say is how I think about, how I would, why it was the voicing that changed everything. Amazing. I love it. Amazing answer. Yeah, the speed round is not working. Um, but... No, it's not working, but it's <laughs> getting us amazing results nonetheless. Great. So I want to get to some playing. Okay. But I have one last question. Okay, shoot. I think it's a huge topic, so I'm going to preempt it by saying, let's not spend too much time on it. But Okay, fair enough. But I want to ask you from the business perspective, I personally have always been very intimidated about the idea of working with a big band. And so I see big bands around the city. You know, some of our friends and you yourself, probably one of the prime examples, of course, having a very successful big band. So I'm just kind of curious with whatever you're comfortable sharing, how do you make that work? How do you organize it? How do you make it financially feasible for people? If someone wants to write big band music, how do they make that a really useful reality in today's music industry? Wow, well, um, it, is a, it is a super deep question. It's a super long conversation. Um, the short answer truly is when there's a will, there's a way. Um, running a big band for all intents and purposes does not make sense. When you say that you, I, you see me having a really successful big band, I would ask like, what does that mean to you? <laughs> like, cause if I show you the, the, the ledger book, like it doesn't make sense. Like, you know, but also being a professional composer, arranger, orchestrator, like absolutely is, you know, there are jobs out there. Um, that exist and you know there is a need I, I can't tell you how many students i've recommended for work that i can't take on for this or that reason and first of all like i just gotta say like i'm so proud of my students who are just crushing the game and i'm i'm, I'm always honored and humbled to be trusted to be a part of somebody's musical journey in that way and in terms of the business side of things when i say that there's a will there's a way like actually do you remember you were you played a rehearsal with my band 
like I do remember this. Yeah, yeah like because for, you wanted to concentrate on the composition. Yeah, yeah, that was actually like you know leading up to the very first recording session that we ever had, where we recorded "I've Got the World on a String" and "My Favorite Things." Yeah, that was. I just. I mean, that has nothing to do with the answer. It's just something that I remembered. Um, as I said before, we started recording. We go way back, and it's true, mm -hmm. dude. Um, yeah, and. On a personal, it's awesome to see everything that you're doing. Thanks, man. I know it right doesn't. Back it's, at you. It's, it's not a part of the. It's not a part of the answer at all. But it, but but I, I'm I'm a huge fan myself Thank you. of, I of your stuff that. and, and I, I you know I think that, I, I guess, I, I guess I, when I started the big band, I I didn't really think about success. I just thought about like I, success to me meant and still means being able to write music that makes me feel something. And yes, I did say makes me feel something because that's that's important to me. I feel that if I don't have an authentic representation of my voice with my instrument and I can't make myself feel something, then why am I doing this? And um, that's the first thing I teach students is to connect with their artistic identity. Um, it's something that's really not taught enough it's really ignored in a lot of academic, institutionalized places of learning. While there's many amazing things that you can and will learn for those of you who, those of you who, who go into school, like I'm, I'm not talking down on that stuff. I'm just saying like your voice is, is important and, and success to me really does mean like, can I write and play music that means something to me and I hope it connects with other people but I, I I can't I can't know if it's going to or not you know you have no idea man there are records that we all love like pro probably records that everybody watching this you and I know you and I know and also people who are watching slash listening to this right now know that when those records came out got terrible reviews you know did people stop listening to those artists? Did those, did those artists stop making music? Okay, then what, like, then, okay. So, I mean, this is a super long answer. I know I'm really not good at the speed round. No, I okay, should have, okay. I should have preempted this with warning you <laughs> how bad I am at, at speed round because it takes me a while to like find the path to the answer that I okay. want to say. But, you know, business wise, having a big band is what has allowed me to have a career as a professional arranger and orchestrator and as a composer. It's proof that I can do what I say that I do. I hired myself before anybody else would, in other words. <laughs> and I invested in, my, in myself before anybody else would. And I still do. I, I still like, you, know, you don't make any money from a big band album. You don't, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know. I mean, maybe, maybe, maybe uh, the Jazz Lincoln Center Orchestra does, maybe, you know, maybe there, you know, maybe there's, there's, and I, I I'm not, I, I mean, I, I, I hesitate to go down the, the, the name, the name game, but, but I guarantee you, I can't guarantee you, because I'm not them, <laughs> but, but I would wager that success probably means a similar thing to those artists as well, where it's really about the authenticity of the music and being true to yourself, and, um, and where it leads, and right? just it's letting, not just about letting it lead, letting your career unfold like Michelangelo lets his statues be carved or something. Beautiful. Some analogy there. Beautiful. The pun wasn't there, so I went with an analogy. I like the analogy. It was really beautifully said. Oh, thanks, dude. Well, cool, man. What do you say we play something? Yeah, I say sure. <laughs> awesome. You want to start her off? No, you start her off. Oh, okay. Or let's start her off.
<laughs> ben, you want to do one more? How about a, um, alone together? Sure. Like what, yeah, Perfect. Something simple and minor. Yeah.
Amazing. <laughs> <laughs>